that's just sort of for your own information. Um, so just sort of to recap, we were looking at the flux of an E field and we defined flux before for gravitational flux. It was the gravitational field times the area. And remember, we are looking for them to be in the same direction. And so we talked about how our area, if we have gravitational flux going in this direction, that if our area is like this, in that case, they're not parallel. Because actually, the area vector is a vector that comes perpendicular from the area. So what we're looking for is our flux lines to go perpendicular to our Gaussian surface. And if we have that, that will give us maximum flux. If we have it at an angle, we're doing the dot product, so we do the cosine of that angle. That was one of your multiple choice problems, by the way, that uh, if you have it at an angle, you get less than the maximum flux, because only a portion of it is actually going perpendicular to the surface. All right, it's the whole cosine theta bit. Um, and so we are now thinking about not gravitational flux, but electric flux. Define this as the sum of electric flux times our area. We said this is a surface integral, which I've not gotten to yet, but you'll get to in count three, I think. Uh, it's just integrating over a surface. And we're going to do surface integrals in piecemeal. So we're not actually going to do the integral, so to speak, but we're going to do it by hand. So it'll be a lot easier to do. But you'll see surface integrals in the future. Uh, and so we considered this cylinder that was sitting inside of an electric field, and we figured out, well, what is the E dot dA? That's the product of our electric field and our area vector uh, for each of the uh, four faces, or each of the three faces, rather, the two faces on the end, and then the cylindrical part around the middle. And we found that in this case, because there's no charge inside of our, or there's no flux here, and but that's because there's no charge inside of the Gaussian surface. Remember, Gauss's law says that the flux is proportional to the amount of charge that's inside the surface. If there's no charge, then there's no net flux. You might have flux in the area, but whatever goes in is also going to come out. Okay. Y'all are really excited about this. Gauss's law is a pretty big deal. It really allows you to tell a lot about the mass or the charge of the configuration that, that you could otherwise know nothing about. No, you're not buying Gauss's law? Okay, well, you'll need to know how to use it on the next test, so uh, make sure that you get that. Let's look at a Gaussian cube. And actually, if you look back, I've given this question on test before, but we want to look at a Gaussian cube and figure out what is the flux through just a few of the faces. I'm going to first just draw the cube. So if we take our uh, x, y, and z coordinates, I'm going to draw the cube so that, bear with me as I draw this three-dimensional surface. This is my Gaussian cube. It doesn't start at the origin. It actually starts at x equal 1, and it goes to x equal 3. All right, so this cube is two units on the side. This is just like the x, z plane, and then it extends up into the y plane. So as I draw this cube, this 2 by 2 by 2 cube, looks like this. Yeah, that's okay, right? You get the feeling for it. It's a two by two by two cube, but it's shifted over from the origin. So it's not at x equals zero, which is right here, but it's shifted over. It is at y equals zero, and it's at z equals zero. It's just shifted over in the x. All right, so that's my cube, a two by two by two cube, and I want to know what is the flux through the right, the left, and the top faces. So the uh, the right face would be this face, the left face would be this face of the cube, and then the top would be that face of the cube. I want to know it through the right, the left, and the top faces. And of course for Gauss's law you need to know all the flux, but just for this activity we just want to figure out through these three faces. And then you can extend it to the other six faces to figure out what is the flux. Now this is the uh, electric field. It's 3xi 
plus 4j newtons per coulomb. So notice the electric field changes with our x position. Uh, as we move through space in the x direction, our electric field will change. That's because we have an unknown configuration of charge in this area. And that configuration of charge creates that electric field. But I don't know what that charge is. And that's what I want to find out eventually is some of that charge inside this Gaussian cube. I know that my electric field looks like that. I want to know, is there some of that charge inside this Gaussian cube? And to do that, I need to figure out the flux, because the flux will be related to the amount of charge. OK, so let's do the right face first. Um, I know that the area of the right face is equal to, it's a vector, and it's equal to the magnitude of the area, dA. And in which direction is the area of the right face? Is it in the i, j, or k, plus or minus direction? Which direction is the area vector for the right face? What is it, Kim? It's in the i direction. Remember, the area vector is always perpendicular to the face and outward facing, too. So in this, for this uh, right face, the area vector is going to be in this direction. So this is dA, and it's in the I direction. So I have a little I right here. That's the first thing that I need to realize. For that particular face, the area vector is to the right. And then to find the flux of the right face, uh, it's going to be the interval of E dot dA. These are vectors. Uh, would I call this a surface integral? Yeah, I guess we can call it a surface integral. Uh, so that's going to be the integral of 3xi plus 4j dotted with my area, which is going to be, uh, gosh, what is the magnitude of the area of that face? It's a square, right? What's the area of that square? Huh? Base times height, right? The base is what? And the height, it's a cube, so it's the same. 2, right? So it's going to be 2 times 2, which is 4. So my area, this magnitude is 4 square meters. So it's going to be e dotted with 4 times i. And it is positive 4 because my i is in the positive direction. So now what I want to do is just take this dot product first, and then I'll do the interval. So let's see. Gosh, I always forget. And I get my dot products and my cross products mixed up sometimes. With dot products, they need to be what? In the same direction or, or perpendicular? What is it? OK, yeah, dot products are scalar, so you just get a number. But in, you know, remember, with cross products and dot products, if they're perpendicular, they give you one. If they're parallel, they give you another. Which is it for dot products? Which gives you zero for the dot product? In the same direction or perpendicular? Which gives you zero? Perpendicular gives you zero. Same direction gives you one. All right, so here, uh, i dot i is equal to one. j dot i is equal to zero. Just remember that for dot products. i dot i equals 1. j dot i, which is the second expansion here, is equal to 0. So this is going to be equal to, then, the integral of 12x. So I'm going to need a dx here because my because uh, I, I still have this. or excuse me, not dx, uh, dA. It's going to be 12x times dA. Oh, wait, no, 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 I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, can I just fix this for a second? And then I'll come back to your question. Um, I'm going to... Let me just re let me backtrack just a little bit, y'all. So we're gonna um, I'm just gonna list this now as dA, and we'll just leave that four right there. So when I get this, it's gonna be um, three x dA. 
All right. I haven't forgotten Unicall. Let me come back to this. So uh, when I do this dot product, 3x times dA i dot i gives me this. Okay. I lose the j dot i term because that's equal to zero. Nicole? Okay, we're going to bring the four back in just a moment, but the four is the magnitude of the area of that face. Area, remember we're talking about it, has both a magnitude and a direction. We don't usually think of area as having a direction, but in this case we do. And that vector, dA, as it relates to this face, has a magnitude of 4, and it's in the plus i direction. All right, we'll come back to that. We'll include that soon. So um, at the position of the right face, here our x is not changing. Our x is constant. What value does x have at the right face? Not everybody at once, please. It's equal to 3. The area is 4, but the value for x is 3. Because notice this right face has got a value of x equal 3. That's just its position in the x plane. It's at a value equal to equal x equal to 3. So I can say then that this is the 3 times 3. I'm going to take that out. The x is 3 times the integral of dA. And when I integrate dA, that gives me the total area. So it's 3 times 3 times the area, which is 3 times 3 times 4. Well, that's 9 times 4, or 36 Newton meters squared per coulomb. This is the unit for flux, by the way. But I remember flux is E times area. Newtons per coulomb is our electric field. Area is meters squared. All right, so we just need to wrap our minds around flux and what flux is and be able to calculate it for these different faces. I want you to take a moment and do the same thing, but for the left face. It's practically identical, except your x is going to have a different value. Your i is going to be in, or excuse me, your area is going to be in a different direction because now our face is facing the opposite direction. So take a minute or so. I want you to do the left face. So now you're going to be doing the left face. I want to know what is the value for the flux through the left face. It's a numeric value, not a vector. What is VL? Let's the only difference here, the only thing is we're going exactly the same, except here, x is not equal to 3 for the left face, x is equal to 1, and here, the area is not in the plus i direction, the area is in the negative i direction. Make sure people sometimes miss this, but our area is in the opposite direction because, well, look, our area vector, dA, points to the left. It points outward and perpendicular to that face. So our flux on the left side will be very, very similar. I'm going to skip ahead. It's going to be the integral of 3x um, negative 3x dA. I skipped up to this point. 
where I included my uh, negative here for DAI. Letting x equal 1, this is going to be negative 3 times the integral of DA, which is going to be negative 3. The area of that face is still 4 meters squared, and so it's going to be negative 12 newton meters squared per coulomb. All right, let's do the top. And let's say the top. Yeah, y'all do the top face. trickier think about your dot products and what happens to your dot product because you're doing a dot product in this whole thing and think about uh, how that dot product comes out so it's, trickier, it's just a little bit different I'm going to start writing it. P step right here, what is the direction of the area of that step? I, J, K? positive J direction. Very good. So because we're looking at the top face, area vector runs perpendicular and outward. So I'm looking at an area vector that is DA in the J direction. And now when you do this dot product, which term goes away? The, the X term, right? The 3X. Because this dot product equals 0. This dot product equals 1. So it's going to be the integral of 4 DA which is going to be 4 dA, which is 4 times 4, or plus 16 newton meters squared per coulomb. The signs are very important here that you get the signs because, you know, if you have no charge inside of your Gaussian surface, that means you'll have no flux. And if you don't include the signs, then you're not going to see that. Uh, it doesn't matter because the, the electric field doesn't change in the y direction, and so you have no y variable here. It's a constant in the y direction. It doesn't change, so uh, you, you know, it doesn't matter where you are on the y-axis. It's always going to be the same. That's a good question. It did change in the x direction. All right, so in applying Gauss's law, you would continue on. There are three other faces, and you would find the flux of those three other faces. Y'all do this in count three, I think, or you will eventually, where you actually integrate over an entire surface. And then, you know, an interval is just a summation. So that's sort of what we're doing here. We're just summing up the area on the entire surface. All right, um, let's look at Gauss's law. There's an example in your homework to do like this. You can, last year I gave an example as well. Uh, you could see similar problems. I could change the shape. Like I can make it into a cylinder. Uh, although in a cylinder it would have to be spherically symmetric so as to uh, get the, the flux correct. But you could think about different shapes or a rectangular prism or I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do a triangular prism. That would be kind of difficult. But similar idea to this. Uh, take a look at your homework. There's an example there. And we'll see another application of it soon too. All right. So we apply this with Gauss's law. So if you remember for gravitational fields, and you had to use this to figure out the, uh, the mass in the cylindrical, the, cylindri the uh, gravitational field of the cylindrical mass, uh, we use the idea for flux. For electric fields, it works very similarly. We say that the flux is equal to uh, Q enclosed over epsilon naught. This is called the permeativity of free space. It's just a constant.
we'll see it again later. And actually, we've already seen it a little bit. Um, you don't need to know this, but k is equal to 1 over 4 pi epsilon naught. So this is sort of a fundamental unit of, of, uh, of nature, the permeativity of free space. And it has a value, it's on your equation sheet, of 8.85 times 10 to the minus 11, which is in, uh, gosh, what are the units there? Second, it doesn't really matter, but seconds to the fourth amps squared over meters cubed coulomb kilogram. Don't sweat that. It's on your equation sheet, okay? It's just a constant. Just know that. Uh, Q enclosed, just like we had with Gauss's law for gravitational fields, where we were looking at the mass inside the Gaussian surface. Now we're just looking at the charge. All right? Units are in coulombs, so often we give charges in micro and nanocoulombs, but make sure that you convert it to coulombs. So this is uh, the enclosed charged. And it's in units of coulombs. All right. Be careful with that, as I said, because sometimes we'll give, often we'll give charges not in coulombs, but in micro or nano coulombs. All right, so let's say that we have three charges right here, and I've drawn three Gaussian surfaces around them. I want you to tell me, is the uh, flux positive, negative, or zero for each of these. We'll do it as a clicker question, okay? So is the is the uh, flux, the net flux, is it A, positive, B, negative, or C, uh, zero for each of these? So we'll look at the... First look at the green one here on the left. Is the net flux positive, negative, or zero? Just the green, right. The green surface. Notice this isn't a regular surface. You can draw your Gaussian surface however the heck you want, but uh, just it's easier to draw them regularly shaped. I'm going to stop at 35. Okay, good. The flux here is positive because I have flux going out. That's all positive if it's going out, but I have no flux going in. Okay, and because I have no flux going in, that would be our negative flux. And so all I have is flux going out. See these flux lines, these field lines? Flux is a field times area. These are positive field lines, they're going out. And so my um, net flux is, is positive. Let's do it for the yellow now. Is the yellow positive, negative, or zero? All right, I'm going to stop at uh, 23, 23. Just guess if you don't know. Okay, that's good. Uh, why is it zero? Huh? Right, because you have flux signs going in and you have flux signs going out. Right, so it's sort of like the cube up here on the previous page that we were looking at. You know, we didn't get the full flux, but notice that some of them came out negative and some of them came out positive. But if you imagine that you have flux lines that are go just going in the left side and then they all come out the right side, the ones on the left side would be negative, the ones on the right side would be positive, so they'd add up to equal zero. So with this more irregular charge configuration. I have flux lines on this side going in, the same flux lines going out on that other side, and so it has zero flux, zero net flux. And we'll try the third one quickly. Uh, this is for the, the magenta on the right, or purple or pink or whatever it is. All right, we'll stop at 15.
Okay, awesome. Uh, so what do you call cheese that doesn't belong to you? Nacho cheese. We all heard that one before. Did I say it last class? Oh, man. <laughs> Sorry, that's embarrassing, isn't it? Did I tell you all that story about the guy? This is actually true. Uh, I was walking out in the quad, and this guy threw a can of Coke at me. Like, hit me in the head. It's not really that funny, because it hurt. Well, it didn't hurt that much, because you know. I was all going, like, you thought some guy would actually throw a Coke and hit me in the head, didn't you? That was he for you anyway. That's a terrible thing to think about somebody. All right. All right. So, uh, listen, guys, another way to tell if our net flux is positive, negative, or zero is based on Gauss's law, right? Gauss's law says that the flux is equal to the enclosed charge, or is proportional to the enclosed charge. So, if I have a negative charge, if this is negative, I have negative flux. Look, can I have positive or negative flux over here? I have negative. If I have no charge, I have no flux. If I have a positive charge enclosed, I have positive flux. And it's proportional to the amount of flux. More charge, more flux. All right, let's do an example. Uh, consider this charge distribution. I give the charges there. What is the net electric flux through that surface, S? Shoot, I'm sorry, that's not a clicker question. What is the net electric flux through the surface S? I'll give you just a moment. You're applying Gauss's law here. I have five charges, surface around three of them. What is the net electric flux? Forget nano is uh, ten to the neg negative nine. Which charges are you going to consider for Gauss's law? Only one, two, and three. They're the only ones inside of the Gaussian surface. Now, there are flux lines that come out of 4 and 5, but, for example, Q4 is positive. This is positive and this is negative. So you can imagine that there are flux lines that, that travel through the surface like that, but whatever flux lines go out or go in also come out. So the net contribution of those flux lines is going to be zero. So I only consider the charges that are inside. I say that um, the flux is equal to the enclosed charge over epsilon naught. And the enclosed charge is just Q1, 2, and 3. Q1 is 3.1. Q2 is minus 5.9. And then Q3 is minus 3.1. And that's times 10 to the minus 9 coulombs divided by 8.85 times 10 to the minus... Did I say 11 before? It's 12. It's 10 to the minus 12. I'm sorry. That's on your equation sheet, don't, so don't sweat it too much. It's not a big deal. Uh, and then that gives us a flux equal to minus 670 newton meters squared per coulomb. So listen, if you have a box with some charges in it, and you want to know, right, what kind of charges do I have in this box? All you got to do is just measure the electric field around that box not that hard to measure the electric field around that box. Figure out what is the electric field all around the box, and boom, Gauss's law, you can figure out what charges are in that box without ever having to look in the box. And that might not seem like a big deal to you now, but it's a pretty big deal that you can use this technique 
to figure out the charge that's enclosed inside a certain area. All right. All right. So um, let's do. Let's look at our cube from the previous problem. I'm just going to remind you that we had, you know, we had this cube. That's a decent cube, right? We had flux that we've already calculated. We said that this was plus 16 newton meter squared per coulomb. We said that this was 36 newton meter squared per coulomb. And that this is 12, or excuse me, negative 12 newton meter squared per coulomb. Those were the three sides that we did. In order to figure out the amount of charge in the box, we need to figure out the total flux. So you have to do the other three sides. We have the front and the back face, and then the bottom face. I'm going to tell you what the uh, bottom is. The bottom face, the flux, is actually negative 16 newton meter squared per coulomb. Or if I really want to be correct about my arrows, I'll draw these in, not out. Um, what are the front and the back faces? So this is the bottom face. Do you know what the front and back faces are? They're zero. Why are they zero, Frankie? Right. There's no electric field in the z direction. All right. So um, the the dot product in the well, you think about it in terms of dot product. Our area vectors are in the either the plus or minus k direction. And as Frankie said, there's no electric field in the k direction, so the dot product goes to zero for the front and the back faces. All right, remember your dot product, okay? Dot product's not that hard anyway, is it, right? Okay, all right, so the front and back have C equal to zero because there's no k component to the electric field. So the dot product goes to zero. All right, so now our net flux, the sum of all our fluxes is going to be negative 12 plus 16 plus 36 minus 16. Let's see, that's, that goes away. 36 minus 12 is 24. You have 24 newton meters squared per coulomb. And so now if I want to know the amount of charge in that box, I say Q is uh, epsilon naught times phi. That's just Gauss's law, you know, rewritten a little bit. And it works out to be 2.1 times 10 to the minus 10 coulombs. So like 0.2 nanocoulombs. All right, one last thing in this little short chapter, and that's going to be Coulomb's Law. We're going to sort of redefine Coulomb's Law. Newton did this with Newton's Universal Law of Gravitation. Remember Coulomb's Law and Law of Gravitation? They're basically the same, just talking about masses and char charges. I do want you to be able to derive this. Uh, it's a pretty easy derivation. So, I start with this idea that E dot dA that's my flux, is equal to Q enclosed divided by epsilon naught. This is what we've been saying. This is on your equation sheet. This is our definition of flux paired with Gauss's law. I can multiply both sides by epsilon naught. Uh, I can assume that these two are parallel, the two vectors. That is that the electric field is going into that face in a perpendicular way. So I can just get rid of that dot product. And so this will be uh, epsilon naught times the integral of EDA. And then that's equal to Q enclosed. All right. Uh, let's assume... So this assumes 
E and A are parallel. Now I can also assume that I have a constant electric field. And if that's the case, I can take the electric field out. So I get epsilon naught E integral of dA equals my Q. And if I assume spherical symmetry, which I will, then my integral of dA integrating over a sphere, what is the area of a sphere? I know. Everything in volume, four thirds is volume. It's uh, four. It's on your equation sheet, but it's if you forget, it's four pi r squared, right? So this is going to be epsilon naught e four pi r squared equals q. And so my electric field then is going to be one over four pi epsilon naught times q over r squared. So this is our, our expression for the electric field, E equals KQ over R squared, which as you know is only one step away from Coulomb's law. In fact, we get this from Coulomb's law. You all recall how that was? Because we said that the electric field is force over Q, and the force is KQQ over R squared divided by Q. And so those cancel out and give us that expression for the electric field. All right, so several steps and several assumptions that you have to make. One, that the electric field and the area are parallel. But if I'm thinking of a charge, say a positive charge, my field lines go out like this. And my Gaussian surface is like that. Then those are perpendicular, or rather... Uh, the area vector and the field vectors are in the same direction. The area is perpendicular to the to the field, so the two vectors line up. Remember, because our area vector is perpendicular to the face of the surface. So that's one assumption. We assume that we have a constant electric field. We also assume spherical symmetry, and we can get back to our Gauss's or our uh, Coulomb's law. All right, uh, that's it on that chapter. So what you need to be able to do is be able to calculate the flux through a surface like we did, be able to apply uh, Gauss's law to find the charge within that surface, know some of those sort of basic things like uh, if I have a positive charge and I have a positive flux, if I have no charge, I have zero flux, if I have a negative charge, inside the surface I have a negative flux. Okay. Uh, let's see. I have a video I wanted to show you all last time. It's fairly interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and show you now, and then I'll hand out the, uh, the exam. Y'all take these homework problems. You should be able to work through all the homework problems. The solutions are online as well.